no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and remember that we have Academy-themed gear at the Academy Store. We appreciate you. The concept of directed energy weapons, including lasers and beam weapons, has been popularized and extensively explored in science fiction literature since at least the mid-20th century. Beam weapons were first described in the novel First Lensman by E.E. E. Doc Smith, published in 1950. In the book, the term tractor beam is used to describe a directed energy weapon that can immobilize or destroy enemy spacecraft. Star Trek fans will remember that a tractor beam was also used to immobilize and move ships in that franchise. The first science fiction use of the term laser may have been in the novel Rogue Ship by A.E. Van Vogt, published in 1965. In that story, the characters use laser weapons as part of their arsenal. The actual development and deployment of practical laser and beam weapon technologies has remained in the realm of science fiction until now. In 1917, Einstein proposed the principle of stimulated emission of radiation, which is one of the fundamental concepts behind laser operation. However, it was not until the 1950s and 60s that the theoretical groundwork for practical laser devices was laid by physicists such as Charles Townes, Arthur Skolaw, and Gordon Gold. While Gold is credited with coining the term laser, and he filed a patent application for it in 1959, Towns and Skolaw independently proposed the basic principles of the laser in 1958. Then Towns built upon Einstein's work and developed the principle of the first maser, microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. These were developed and used before an actual laser. The laser, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, came just a few years later. These scientists, along with many others who followed, conducted the experimental and theoretical work that led to the development of the first working laser devices in the early 1960s. Researchers have since been making steady progress and are now developing high-power lasers that are more compact and efficient. This includes advancements in solid-state lasers, and these systems are now ready for the battlefield and eventually space. One of the first and largest military lasers in use is the Laser Weapon System, developed by the United States Navy, also called LAWS. LAWS is a laser weapon designed to be used for defense against small boats, drones, and other similar threats. The LAWS system was first deployed aboard the USS Ponce, an amphibious transport dock ship, and since 2014, it had been a part of an operational demonstration. This system uses a solid-state laser, specifically it employs a solid-state laser diode as the primary source of laser energy for its operations. The power output of LAWS is reported to be in the range of tens of kilowatts. Solid-state lasers use a solid material as the gain medium, which is responsible for amplifying the light to produce a laser beam. In the case of LAWS, some of the details of the solid-state laser are still classified, such as the exact composition of the gain medium or the specific laser architecture. And even the rules of engagement that have been developed for its use have not been released. Although the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons Rules of Engagement, ROE, prohibits using laser weapons against humans. The Navy has released video of the laws on deployment, disabling a Scan Eagle UAV, detonating a rocket-propelled grenade, and burning out the engine of a rigid hull inflatable boat. Officials said it is working beyond expectations, and its use has expanded to other U.S. Navy vessels. Compared to hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars for a single missile, one laser shot costs only 59 cents of electricity. But this is a little misleading. You have to factor in the developmental cost of the laser, the cost of deploying it, and the actual number of shots it will be able to take before it needs to be refurbished or replaced. Solid-state lasers are known for their compactness, efficiency, and scalability. They can generate high-power laser beams by pumping energy into a solid material, often a crystal or a glass, through optical or electrical means. The solid material, when stimulated, emits photons that are reflected back and forth between mirrors, thus amplifying the light until a high-intensity laser beam is produced. Most lasers you will see in commercial use are crystal lasers, usually a crystal called YAG, which stands for Yttrium Aluminum Garnet. This crystal will be doped with a lasing element 
like erbium or neodymium, and these usually produce visible light. They have many uses in the healthcare field, being used to rejuvenate skin and even dissolve subcutaneous fat cells. The only fusion system on Earth that has produced more energy than was delivered to the target is at the National Ignition Facility in the United States. This is the largest and most powerful of a type of reactor called inertial confinement fusion. This project was started in 1957, and it wasn't until August of 2021 that it was able to announce the world's first burning plasma. In plasma physics, a burning plasma is one in which most of the heating comes from fusion reactions involving thermal plasma ions, and no longer from the lasers being pumped into it. The sun and similar stars are a burning plasma, and in 2022, the National Ignition Facility achieved this goal. In December of that same year, they were able to produce 3.15 megajoules of energy from a 2.05 megajoule input of laser light. Though this is a milestone achievement, it did take 400 megajoules of energy to charge the lasers used. The lasers used at the NIF are solid state lasers using 192 neodymium doped glass lasers to produce a wavelength of 1,053 nanometers. This is near infrared barely visible to the human eye. Military lasers are now usually of a different type. You don't get to see these lasers burning through the sky because these are infrared lasers and therefore invisible to human vision. In space, all lasers would work about the same, but on Earth, using infrared wavelengths reduces absorption by the atmosphere, increasing the laser's range and power delivery. Producing coherent infrared light had been difficult, but new types of laser systems are solving that problem. Some use an infrared light emitting diode, just like an LED. These are also used in the cosmetic industry for hair removal, as they will burn out the hair follicle without the energy being absorbed by the skin. For high power infrared laser light production, another type of laser that excels is the quantum cascade laser. In this type of laser, photons tunnel through a stack of semiconductor quantum well heterostructures. A quantum well has certain discrete energy values, allowing only certain frequencies of light to pass thereby turning random light or energy into coherent light. QCLs have gained attention due to their potential applications in sensing, spectroscopy, and defense technologies. Ongoing research aims to improve the performance and expand the range of QCLs. Here are some key advantages of QCLs. QCLs can cover a wide range of wavelengths in the mid-infrared region, enabling the selective and precise targeting of specific molecular absorption lines. This makes QCLs highly suitable for applications such as spectroscopy, chemical sensing, and trace gas analysis. QCLs can also generate high optical power, often in the range of milliwatts to watts, providing strong signal levels for detection and measurement. They can also achieve high conversion efficiency, resulting in better energy utilization and reduced power consumption. QCLs can be operated in continuous wave mode or pulsed mode offering flexibility in terms of different applications and experimental requirements. Pulsed QCLs can provide short pulses in the picosecond or femtosecond range, allowing for time-resolved measurements. QCLs can be designed to be compact and rugged, making them suitable for integration into portable or field-deployable systems. Their solid-state nature and robust construction enhance their reliability and durability in various environments. Unlike some other mid-infrared lasers that require cryogenic cooling for operation, QCLs can operate at room temperature. This eliminates the need for complex and costly cooling systems, simplifying their use and reducing overall system complexity. Another important factor in the effectiveness of a laser is how quickly you can release the laser energy. Think of it like a car taking a week to hit you compared to one that takes half a second. Since power is energy over time, as the time gets shorter, the power goes up. The Extreme Light Infrastructure, ELI, beamline located in the Czech Republic utilizes high power lasers based on advanced solid state laser technology. Specifically, ELI beamlines employ high power femtosecond laser systems. One femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Some of the specifications and details are not publicly available. However, femtosecond lasers are, have been extensively employed in beamlines for various scientific experiments, including laser driven particle acceleration. ELI researchers have achieved significant advancements in accelerating charged particles, such as electrons and ions, to high energies over short distances. This research has implications for particle physics, medical applications, and future particle accelerator technologies. 
as well as for the space industry. These lasers typically utilize solid state gain media such as titanium doped sapphire crystals to generate these ultra short pulses. Femtosecond lasers offer advantages such as precise control over pulse duration and high peak powers, allowing for the study of ultra-fast phenomena and interaction with matter at extreme intensities. They find applications in fields such as high energy physics, attosecond science, laser-driven particle acceleration, and laser-matter interactions. Attosecond lasers produce ultra-short laser pulses on the time scale of an attosecond, 10 to the minus 18 seconds. These lasers allow scientists to study ultra-fast processes in atoms and molecules. The camera is um, much larger than what you would expect from a regular camera like the one over here. Our light source is a titanium sapphire laser that's over here and it emits a beam of very, very short pulses and that those pulses are then directed to the scene with these mirrors. Now, our camera only sees one dimension. So it makes a fast movie, but it makes a fast movie of one line of the scene only. And in order to fix that, we have these two mirrors here. We look at the scene via these two mirrors, and when we rotate this upper mirror here, we actually see different lines of the scene. So what's happening is the camera keeps taking images, and we very slowly rotate this mirror to scan our field of view across the entire scene. And because all of our pulses look the same, we can in the end go and combine all these images that we took to get one complete movie of the scene. Such a camera may be useful in medical imaging, in industrial or scientific use, and the future even for consumer photography. Atosecond lasers have the potential to advance several fields such as ultra-fast spectroscopy, high-speed electronics, and fusion energy devices. When we have hundreds of people traveling into space routinely. Lasers will be needed to help deflect micrometeoroids. These are small natural pieces of rock or metal that travel at high speed through space, acting like bullets. We also need to worry about debris left in space by humans, and even entire derelict spacecraft. Laser defense systems will be critical to protecting people in space, at least until we can create anti-proton beams. Nothing has the potential to transmit more power in space than a concentrated antimatter impact. But until that time, lasers and masers are it. Lasers have another purpose for spaceflight, something called a Wakefield Drive. Here's a patent application I worked on many years ago. The Wakefield Effect, also called Laser Wakefield Acceleration, is a promising technique for particle acceleration. Efficient particle acceleration is, after all, the goal of every rocket engine. How much propellant mass goes through your engine per second times the velocity of the mass as it leaves the nozzle determines the thrust and efficiency of your engine. The faster your exhaust velocity, the less propellant you will need to get somewhere with the same delta V. Let's look at how this works for chemical engines. Let's say we wanted to launch from the Earth and get to orbit with our spaceship here, and we want to do it without staging. We will need about 9.4 kilometers per second of delta V, losing about 1.6 kilometers per second to atmospheric and gravity drag, ending up with 7.8 kilometers per second in low Earth orbit. We have decided to use something like the Chrysler Serve as a single stage to orbit vehicle. And let's assume that our ship up here is about 35 metric tons total, and the dry mass of this giant booster can be kept around 100 metric tons. If we allow 15 metric tons for the ship to go back and land, we see that we need to get 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit. We are familiar with the specific impulse of different rocket engines. Let's assume that we are limited to RP-1, methane, and hydrogen for chemical rocket engines. And let's compare what it would take for each of these to get the job done. We put in the specific impulse for each of these propellants. This uses an aerospike effect, so we don't need sea level and vacuum engines. But we must factor in that the atmospheric pressure outside a rocket engine robs a little of our efficiency. Let's take an average of our specific impulse for each of these propellants, then calculate the initial mass necessary to end up with this final mass in orbit by using our formula here and knowing that E equals 2.7183, and here is our delta V, and then we calculate our exhaust velocity. Here's how it all comes out. As you can see, the percentage of your booster that must be propellant goes down as the efficiency of the engine measured by specific impulse, goes up. 
Now we would also need to consider the density of these propellants. Assuming they are all burning with liquid oxygen at an optimal oxidizer to fuel ratio to see how much volume the booster would actually need to hold. Here you can see that because hydrogen has a very low density, it would need to be really huge. Now if we had a nuclear thermal rocket, which also uses hydrogen as a propellant, we wouldn't need any oxygen at all. And we would have a specific impulse of around 900 seconds. That would dramatically reduce the size of the ship needed. But let's go back to lasers. The Wakefield effect uses intense laser pulses to create a type of plasma-based acceleration method that utilizes the electric field created within a plasma by an intense laser pulse to accelerate charged particles, typically electrons, to very high energies over short distances. Looking closely at how this works, the basic principle of laser wake field acceleration involves a laser pulse interacting with a plasma medium. When an intense laser pulse is focused into a plasma, it creates a plasma wave. This is known as the wake field, by displacing the electrons in the plasma. This displacement creates regions of relative positive and negative charge within the plasma. The electric field of this wake field acts as a surfing wave for charged particles, especially the lighter electrons. As the wake field propagates, electrons that are injected into the region behind the laser pulse experience a strong electric field that accelerates them to relativistic velocities. Relativistic velocities means the electrons have velocities a substantial fraction of the speed of light. This process results in high energy electrons being trapped and accelerated within the plasma wave. Compared to traditional particle accelerators, laser wake field acceleration offers several advantages. They have an unbelievably compact size, allowing very significant particle acceleration over very short distances, typically on the order of centimeters or even millimeters. This compact size makes it attractive for potential applications where traditional accelerators are impractical or expensive, like for spaceflight. This process can generate these extremely high accelerating gradients over these very short distances. Now remember that for light, frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. Engineers often use frequency to describe electromagnetic radiation, while scientists often use wavelength. It turns out that for the wake field effect to work, the pulse length of our laser light needs to be equal to or less than half its wavelength. That means we would need femtosecond pulses for most visible light lasers, and even faster pulses with higher frequency shorter wavelength lasers, like ultraviolet, x-rays, or gamma rays. On the other hand, an engine using microwaves could have a much longer pulse length and still be less than half the wavelength. We just need to make sure that we use a laser frequency slash wavelength that will be absorbed by our propellant. Now let's make our Wakefield drive rocket engine. We could use fast pulsing diode lasers in very small channels on the exterior of the ship. We could inject a fine mist of propellant gas, water perhaps. Several companies are using microwave thrusters with water propellant. Let's do the same thing, but let's fire the microwave pulses at less than half the wavelength. Only a fraction of electrons will reach relativistic velocities, but these will create moving electric gradients, waves that move through the plasma dragging ions along with them, allowing us to accelerate all the water propellant out of the rocket engine at a much higher average velocity. Now the speed of light is 2.997 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And the best modern chemical rocket engines have an exhaust velocity a little more than 0.001% of the speed of light. The nuclear thermal rocket jumps up to 0.003%. If our wake field drive can give us 0.01%, a little more than three times better than a nuclear rocket, and we have enough power to run it, we would only need a propellant mass one-fourth the mass of the ship. That means we could do without all of this and get to orbit with just this. This sounds fantastic until we realize what an obstacle the power question is. Chemical engines produce their own power in the chemical reaction of combustion. The nuclear thermal engine produces heat by radioactive decay and is more efficient than chemical engines. But for nuclear engines right now, the thrust to weight ratio is not high enough to lift off from Earth and get to orbit. 
Fusion might be on the horizon, but it's not here yet. But if we can get a small modular nuclear reactor or a small fusion device working to give us enough energy, we can just use them in space, where everything is radioactive anyway. Nuclear engines would be perfect when it comes to our Wakefield drive. Now with lasers, we also run into a problem with conversion efficiency. Most lasers can only turn about 20% of the input energy into coherent light. And the Wakefield effect itself only accelerates a small percentage of the propellant. That's why we needed to go by average exhaust velocity, which is much lower than the laser accelerate electrons and ions at their fastest. But we talked about using microwaves, and microwaves can be generated with an efficiency of almost 90%. That means if we can build efficient masers, which have just started to be developed, we could use a nuclear power source to produce very efficient spaceships using nuclear thermal for high thrust maneuvers and wakefield acceleration for long range missions. Maybe someday I will get to see one of these powering a spaceship through the solar system or even a long range probe going to another star. Something to think about. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astra Proterra. When you look at something like the Large Hadron Collider, which is 17 miles in circumference, it's an example of pushing the limits of really what's feasibly achievable in terms of the scale of a particle collider for exploring the fundamental physics that describe the universe. In order to go to the next level, to push the energy boundary even higher, one can imagine trying to build larger machines, but you reach a limit at some point. And in order to go those higher energies, we have to think of a paradigm shift in the way that we accelerate our particles so we can accelerate them to higher energies in much less space. Plasma wake field acceleration is a new concept for accelerating particles up to very high energies. The primary advantages it offers are that it can do this in a very compact amount of space and can do this with a very high energy transfer efficiency. So the power consumed in the process of acceleration can be quite low compared to traditional means of accelerating particles. The original ideas for plasma wake field acceleration are almost three decades old. The first papers came out in 79 and the early 80s showing that you, in theory, could make these big waves in the plasma. But it's really in the last decades that things have gotten so interesting as people have started to apply the tools like the SLAC LINAC to make these very large amplitude waves in the plasma. So FACET's really a progression between showing that we can make these large amplitude waves in a plasma and use them to accelerate beams that actually have the properties that experimenters and researchers want. Plasma is an ionized gas. So you take a solid, you heat it up, it melts to a liquid. Keep heating the liquid, it boils to a gas. If you keep heating the gas, then the pieces that make up the gas start to come apart. So you get negatively charged electrons and positively charged nuclei all swimming around together. So the first bunch of electrons enters the plasma and acts like a plow, and it pushes all of the plasma electrons out of the way. Left behind inside of that wake are the positively charged atoms that haven't moved because of their mass. The positive charge of those, the net positive charge of those atoms left behind then pulls the plasma electrons back in toward the axis. The second bunch of electrons traveling behind the drive bunch is inside of this wake structure. 
and it experiences the strong electric fields that then allow it to gain a lot of energy in a very short amount of space. We heat an oven up to 1,000 degrees centigrade and it makes a column of lithium vapor. And then we ionize that lithium vapor using a laser pulse with a special focusing optic called an axcon. And it ionizes a very long filament in that plasma, which we then align and put it right on top of the electron beam trajectory. So now we have that ionized lithium vapor, and then we send the particle beam in right on top of that, and it generates these large amplitude waves. So we hope in the future that using plasma wake field accelerator technology, we can make accelerators that instead of taking kilometers of space to get these beams up to the very high energies that are useful for particle physics and photon scientists, we hope that we can make these very same high energy beams in a much more compact space that you use to fit in the basement of a hospital or in a university so that many more researchers can have access to these great tools.